Far from the rush of ordinary headlines, the ground southwest of Nikolsky, Alaska, shifted in early September of 2025. At a shallow depth of about six miles, the United States Geological Survey recorded a magnitude 6.0 earthquake roughly 54 miles or 87 kilometers southwest of the settlement in the Fox Islands of the Aleutian Arc. State seismologist Michael West later described it as the type of earthquake you read about in an intro to geology textbook. His words carried more gravity than they seemed. This was no random tremor, but a classic demonstration of what happens where the Pacific Plate dives beneath North America along one of Earth's most dangerous subduction zones. In most populated regions, such an event would have carried serious consequences, but here damage was avoided. Still, the significance lied not in the shaking alone. The Aleutian Trench has produced some of the largest earthquakes in history, and scientists know it will do so again. The Nikolsky tremor was not even the year's only reminder. In March, a magnitude 6.2 struck near Adak, followed in July by a magnitude 7.3 rupture south of Sandpoint at a depth of about 12 miles or 20 kilometers. That July event briefly triggered tsunami warnings before subsiding with little effect, yet both sequences produced dozens of aftershocks between magnitude 5 and 6. None caused widespread destruction but together they suggested a fault system adjusting itself in increments. As West noted, there remains that small percentage possibility of something a bit larger still locked along the trench. The Aleutian Arc stretches for more than 1,800 miles, or 3,000 kilometers, from the Gulf of Alaska to Kamchatka. But it is far from uniform. In the east, where the plates collide nearly head-on, the Pacific Plate plunges steeply beneath the continental crust, producing the most dangerous thrust quakes. In the central section, convergence becomes more oblique, so much of the motion is taken up by strike-slip shearing. In the far west, the plate boundary transforms into a predominantly horizontal fault system, more like California's San Andreas. This segmentation is critical. The eastern Aleutians, including Nikolsky, are the sectors most prone to giant thrust earthquakes capable of generating tsunamis that cross the ocean basin. Geophysicists describe the Aleutian megathrust as a patchwork of locked and creeping patches. During the interseismic period, the two plates grind to a halt, storing elastic strain like a compressed spring. When friction is overcome, they rupture cosyismically, releasing decades or centuries of accumulated motion in a matter of seconds. Afterward comes the post-seismic phase, when the crust relaxes and readjusts, sometimes triggering swarms of aftershocks or slow-slip events. This three-part cycle repeats endlessly, and in the eastern Aleutians the locked patches are extensive, which is why this sector is considered overdue for another major release. The record speaks for itself. The Andrianov Islands quake of 1957 ruptured across more than 600 miles or 1,000 kilometers, reaching magnitude 8.6. The Rat Islands quake of 1965 measured magnitude 8.7 and produced a powerful trans-Pacific tsunami. The Andrianov segment ruptured again in 1986 and 1996 with events near magnitude 8. More recently, in July of 2021, a magnitude 8.2 earthquake struck off the Shumagin Islands, again issuing tsunami warnings from Alaska to Japan. Geological investigations add still older chapters. Sand sheets in Alaskan marshes and tsunami deposits in Hawaii show that in the 14th, 15th and 18th centuries, eastern Aleutian ruptures reached or exceeded magnitude 8.4, inundating Pacific shorelines thousands of miles away. Radiocarbon dating of driftwood and microfossils ties these layers to quakes so large that their waves surpass those of the mid-20th century. Yet the trench's complexity means not all quakes behave the same way. Some slip deep along the plate interface, releasing strain without displacing the sea floor. Others rupture slowly at shallow depth, producing deceptively small ground-shaking but immense tsunamis. The Unimac event of 1946 is the textbook case, a magnitude 8.6 that generated a wave more than 100 feet or 30 meters high that obliterated the Scotch Cap lighthouse and killed its keepers, then traveled across the Pacific to Hawaii, where it caused dozens of fatalities. 
Seismologists later coined the term tsunami earthquake for such events, whose rupture velocity is unusually low and whose energy is channeled into water displacement rather than seismic waves. The Aleutians, with their thick sediment wedge and shallow subduction angle in places, are particularly suited to producing these deceptive quakes. The physics of tsunami generation are equally intricate. A quake that ruptures near the seafloor displaces water vertically, sending long wavelength waves racing across the ocean at jetliner speeds. Bathymetry shapes how they propagate. Ridges can focus energy while basins amplify it. Numerical simulations now model these waves in near real time using data from ocean bottom pressure sensors and GPS buoys. But the basic principle is centuries old. The shallower and broader the slip, the more devastating the wave. Modern monitoring has made enormous strides. The Alaska Earthquake Center operates one of the densest seismic networks in the world, complemented by continuous GPS receivers that measure ground motion to within millimeters. Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, or INSAR, adds a satellite perspective, mapping how entire swathes of crust deform between quakes. Offshore, NOAA's DART buoys stand sentinel, detecting minute pressure changes as tsunamis pass overhead. Together, these systems allow scientists to build finite fault models within minutes of a rupture, and run tsunami simulations that feed directly into warning systems. Each moderate quake, like Nikolsky's 6.0, is therefore both a hazard in its own right and a live test of this global monitoring network. The interplay of stress and strain goes beyond local mechanics. When one patch ruptures, it alters the Coulomb stress field around it, effectively loading or unloading its neighbours. This process explains why large earthquakes often cluster in space and time. The Great Alaska Earthquake of 1964, magnitude 9.2, followed less than a decade after the 1957 Andrianov rupture. Some researchers suggest that the redistribution of stress along the plate interface may have advanced the timing of the later catastrophe. In the Aleutians, where locked and creeping patches sit side by side, this domino effect is a constant concern. The arc's hazards are not confined to shaking and water. The Aleutians are dotted with active volcanoes, Shishaldin, Cleveland, Bogoslov among them, and though the link between seismicity and volcanism remains debated, evidence suggests that major earthquakes can perturb magma systems. After the 1964 quake, shifts in volcanic activity were documented along the arc. Stress changes in the crust can alter the pathways that magma follows, potentially triggering eruptions months or even years after a megathrust rupture. Thus, a single quake may cascade into multiple types of hazard. Ground motion, tsunamis, and volcanic unrest. Comparisons with other subduction systems sharpen the picture. Japan's Nankai Trough, Chile's subduction margin, and Cascadia off the Pacific Northwest are all capable of magnitude 9 earthquakes, yet the Aleutians have already demonstrated multiple magnitude 8.6 to 8.7 events within the past century. The convergence rate here, about 3 inches or 7 centimeters per year, is on par with the world's most dangerous zones. What sets the Aleutians apart is their relative isolation. Fewer people live along this arc than along Cascadia or Nankai. That reduces immediate casualties, but does nothing to diminish global tsunami consequences. As NOAA tsunami scientist Vasily Titov has observed, what happens in the Aleutians does not stay in the Aleutians. A rupture there can send waves across the Pacific Basin in hours, testing warning systems from Chile to Japan. Paleoseismology continues to extend the timeline further back. Coastal cores from Hawaii reveal sand layers deposited by distant Aleutian tsunamis in the 14th and 18th centuries. Some Californian estuaries may also bear faint traces. Dating these deposits requires radiocarbon analysis of organic material, cross-checked with microfossils that identify marine versus terrestrial origin, the uncertainties are large, but the evidence converges. The Aleutians have repeatedly generated waves greater than any seen since instrumental records began. The recurrence intervals appear to be on the order of several centuries, though with wide variability. The gap since the last full-segment eastern rupture has already stretched beyond two centuries, longer than some previous cycles, a fact that fuels present concern. The Nikolsky quake in this light is more than a footnote. 
It is a data point in a system that has been grinding since the Pacific Plate began diving beneath Alaska tens of millions of years ago. The trench is both engine and clock, consuming oceanic crust at nearly three inches or seven centimeters per year, winding tension with each passing season until the rocks yield. That inevitability is what makes even moderate tremors matter. They remind us that the Aleutian Trench has produced megaquakes before, and it will again. The only questions are when, how large, and whether the rupture will remain confined or cascade across hundreds of miles of fault. Human perception anchors around the span of lifetimes, but geology works in centuries. The 6.0 near Nikolsky is a flicker in a cycle measured by paleot tsunami deposits and seismic scars. To seismologists, it is not a question of if another magnitude 8 or 9 will strike, but of which locked patch will fail, and how many neighbours it will pull with it, whether it triggers a wave that dissipates harmlessly, or a tsunami that strikes shores thousands of miles away, it is part of the same relentless process. The slow grinding of plates that powers the Pacific Ring of Fire. If this exploration of the Aleutian Trench helped you see Earth's forces in a new light, consider sharing it with others. A simple like, share or subscribe, and don't forget to click that hype button to help this video be seen by others, keeps work like this visible supports deeper reporting on our planet's restless systems, and helps build a community of viewers who care about understanding the science behind tomorrow's headlines.